All right, so this is our first case. It's a 42-year-old male, right-hand dominant, fell riding his bike. Weekend warrior, like most New Yorkers, works in finance. He was wearing his helmet, so you don't have to worry about any head stuff. Uh, nerve vascular intact, and no issues with his arm prior to the injury. So this is his x-ray. All right, so uh, Dan, what do you see? And we got two Dan's. Yeah, I know, Dan, Dan number uh, one. Yeah. Uh, so um, there's a mid-shaft clavicle fracture there. It's obviously displaced some. Um, uh, not really certain too much. There's a butterfly fragment, kind of mid-shaft there. Okay. Uh, anything you look for on exam that you want to make sure is not a problem or a problem? Or how do you examine these folks? I mean, really the main thing I look at is the skin there, making sure that the skin's okay, he's not tenting too much. Okay. Um, I mean, you check some of the nerve stuff, but it's not a huge concern for this sort of injury. So the main thing I look at is the skin. I want to make sure, obviously, that the shoulder's okay. So I do, he can't really move his shoulder very well because it hurts, but I try and just get a sense that make sure things are okay in the shoulder and the elbow. Okay. Dan, number two, any other imaging that you typically get for these injuries? I would get an orthogonal view of the clavicle, but uh, I don't typically, at a 42-year-old with no antecedent shoulder problems, I wouldn't typically okay. get more. So no this. CT scan, no MR, nothing like that? No. Okay. All right, so David, he's in your office, and you know he's got this broken clavicle. What do you, what do, you do? How do you talk to him? What, what are you telling him about his injury, and how are you going to try to manage it? Well, obviously, he's got kind of a, a standard clavicle fracture that we see. Um, he's probably not shortened that much. Uh, he's displaced, but he's got a good Z fragment in there, or two Z fragments there. Um, I'd have a kind of long discussion with him about, you know, operative versus non-operative management. I think it's possible that this will heal on its own. Many of our mid-shaft clavicle fractures will. Uh, this is a little bit higher energy fracture. It is fairly comminuted. It is fairly displaced. In a 42-year-old, otherwise active, uh, dominant side, I probably would recommend fixing this. Okay. Matt, what do you think? I mean, I would probably trend towards that, too. So I'd, I'd have the guy look in the mirror, get an idea of, like, what kind of shoulder ptosis he has, if he can live with that, tell him he's going to have a deformity if it heals. At 42, it'll probably heal. Right. Uh, the other thing they don't seem to like is that kind of accordion sensation early on. Okay. I, I think you give them, you know, you get rid of that bag of bones feeling by fix it, fixing it. I, I would probably recommend getting this fixed okay. um, because I think it'll make them feel better in the short run. Uh, and also, in the long run, it, it'll probably decrease the chance that he has like periscapular pain. And so that's a great point. So, you know, none of you guys, or at least hadn't mentioned that you look at the scapula. So, do you look at the scapula, Matt, when you examine these folks? Uh, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> do I? Good answer. Not? Uh, you know, but I, I actually just talk more about the scapula in the long run. You know, in the yeah. military studies, it seems like most of these will usually heal, but if they have any long term problem, it's usually like a periscapular discomfort. So I was seeing Marty last night, and he was telling me, you know, I, when I was a fellow with Jerry and, and Matt, uh, the, the therapist that they have working for them taught me a, a ton about the scapula. So when you look at these patients initially with their scapula, they often have a bit of drooping and dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. And you look at their shoulder girdle, that side's going to be down. And that's because of the foreshortening and the displacement. And I think that's why these patients sometimes get a symptomatic malunion, because of the scapula thoracic issues that they can, they can get. So all right, so for the audience. If this was your clavicle, who would want this fixed? Raise your hand. And who would not want it fixed? Raise your hand. Does it matter to you if it's your dominant arm? So if it's your dominant arm, would you want it fixed? I think it no depends on the activity, right? If you're okay. an overhead athlete, yeah. you play a lot of tennis, if okay. you throw, or, you know, coach baseball and you're pitching or whatever to the kids, I think it matters. So right. uh, I think kind of their activity of the patient and what you want to do as okay. well. I mean, if you're all doing is knitting all day, may not matter quite so yeah. much. All right, I like that. So for you guys down the panel, so Matt's fixing it, Dave's fixing it, two yeah, Dan's. I think, I think the other thing is is that that's going to get you back to activities a lot more quickly. You know, having had neck surgery two years ago, my biggest concern with the surgery was actually not the surgery, it was how, how quickly I could get back to working. And I do think that you could probably facilitate getting back to operating and at least seeing patients in the office a little bit more quickly. Okay. So I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with this study, and a lot of us use this study as a guide, at least in counseling patients, at least I do. And you know, for me, the take-home message with this really is, is that what David just said, that if you fix it, they may get back to things a little faster. It probably doesn't change you know, the, the long-term result, maybe. Um, but I do think that if you have a, a displaced commutative fracture, 
uh, in these patients, it might allow them a faster recovery of sort of depend, you know, use of their arm and things like that. The other thing I think you should take from this study is, is the amount of hardware issues people have, which I think in the clavicle is perhaps underappreciated, and it's one of the things that I look at when I'm, I'm treating these people and, and think about and I counsel them about. This study is actually the one that I use the most. So this is the study that changed the way I think about clavicle fractures. This is an earlier study out of, uh, out of Scandinavia or Norway, and this is from a registry that they have. And, and so this is the, the study that I use to counsel people in terms of the fracture morphology they have. So the classic Z fracture, which is the x-ray I showed, where you've got the intercalary vertical pieces, you've got the shortening and displacement, those are the ones that are more likely to get a symptomatic malunion. So like Dan said, in an active person, especially dominant arm, you know, I'm going to counsel them that this is a, perhaps a bad actor. It will heal, as David said, but it's going to heal in a, in a malunited position, which may lead to scapulothoracic issues and other problems. And so, you know, this is what I will, will point to people. So if you're not familiar with this study, it's a good study to, to appreciate. All right, so we're going to fix this because we're fixing all of these fractures. So Dan, number two, how do you approach this? What's your setup? Give me your pearls. Any, what, what equipment do you use? Are you using a rockwood? Are you using a, a pin? Are you using a plate? What are you, what are you doing? I would, I would do a beach chair. We'll bring the C-arm in, usually from the opposite side. Make sure before you prep and drape that you can get the appropriate views with the C-arm because that's always a problem when you can't see the, the x-rays or get a good view. So okay. make sure you do that. Um, then I would typically just do a, uh, an open approach, open reduction internal fixation with the with a plate, uh, plate screws. Uh, I honestly don't know if the plate I use is titanium or st stainless steel, so I apologize. Um, uh, no, no real tricks or pearls other than typically with a Z fragment like that, try to get it reduced provisionally uh, with some reduction clamps uh, yeah. and then get the plate on. Um, if, if it has a, a piece that you can get a an interfrag screw through, I would do that to okay. try to get it. Try to make it into two pieces before uh, you get the plate across it. but. Basically, just trying to get uh, the plate. I use a superior plate, um, and so a superior plate, not an anterior plate or anything. Anybody here use an intermedullary nail or pin? Anybody in the audience use that? Any of the intermedullary devices for the clavicle? And so, for you, what, what's your what's the benefit for you in using that? Do you mind speaking yeah. loud? So, quick question about the incision type. Does everybody just make an incision along the length of the clavicle on the panel? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Little anterior. Okay. But, yeah. Skin nerves, do you worry about the little subcutaneous nerves? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you dissect them out and find them? Try to find three. That's like the goal. God of bless you, buddy. Try to find three. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I take the opposite approach. I just tell people they're going to be numb lateral to the incision line. I still do that. <laughs> but I, I think that's the key, right? The key yeah. is, is to be to understand that the nerves are there and to talk to your patients ahead of time. And as long as you talk to them ahead of time yeah. and set them up for that, you'll have success. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Sethi, yes. Brent, are you going to showcase about of an athlete, like a high school athlete, discuss that, discuss return to play? Well, I'm going to get to that, not necessarily high school athlete, but I am going to ask that question in two slides. So, and then the other thing I wanted to about is dual plating. You know, the very NFL thing right now is dual plate. Anyone on the panel or where you guys are going? So, if you're treating Lance Armstrong, are you guys going to do a dual plate? Because he had a dual plate, that's why I'm, no. I'm asking. <laughs> so anybody here do a dual plating? I, no. I've done it once or twice, and basically I'll do it because the obliquity of the fracture extends so long, it's hard to get enough cortices on either side. Or a lot of times laterally, you'll just, you know, if it's a mid shaft that extends far enough yeah. distally, you can just use a lateral clavicle plate that's long to get more fixation. But it just depends. I haven't had to do it much, but if I feel like I just need a little bit more, I'll, I can put a small anterior plate. What plate are you using for the second plate? Uh, I think I, I think I've used the Acumed, so I think they have specialized. Plates. So they have a small little mini frag plate. Yeah. Anybody have a lot of experience with dual plating in the audience? Dr. Sethi does, evidently. Get to the mic, buddy. Don't be lazy. <laughs> First thing in the morning, you're supposed to be spry and sorry, Dr. Parsons, sir. So the question's going to be, and I, I was. That's I'll scotch. A, that's a first. So the question's going to be, and it's going to sort of relate to when do you let the athlete, the, the collision I'm athlete. I'm getting there. I don't want to. But the dual plate's going to play a role in that, right? Because I think that with a dual plate, you have more rigidity. And I'm going to use a 2.9 and a 2.4. So you're not going to use the same plate used superiorly or anteriorly. You're going to use two smaller plates. Um, and that's where, that's where it'll, it'll be an interesting discussion. 
Gotcha. So I, the reason I asked about plate type is I don't like titanium in the clavicle. And the reason being is that, at least in the Canadian study, 10% hardware removal. And the problem with titanium is the head strip. And then you're stuck with screws that you can't take out. So I personally like a stainless steel plate for the clavicle. Different for proximal humerus and other things, but because the, the head's a little harder, it doesn't strip as much. A, a couple other things about when you're setting up this case, I think a couple other pearls that probably can help people out are number one, uh, an articulated arm holder can make a big difference in helping you position. And then the second thing is I actually like to have two different systems available and you can take any two that are out there because the reality is everybody has a little bit different anatomy and as these are all pre-contoured plates, I have found that sometimes the plates that you have don't exactly fit. And so having two vendors there, I think, makes a big difference. Do you have the battle for your Great, business? great point. Yeah, they fight. No, I literally put it up to the, the clavicle, and that's what it is. So this is the incision I use, and I have gone away from a longitudinal incision. The reason I use this incision is twofold. One is it's very cosmetic. It's in skin lines, and your exposure actually is quite good. Secondly is you only have an inch of scar over the plate. So in practice now, whatever, 16, 7 years, I've taken two clavicle plates out. And we actually looked at this uh, with a study we did compared to the colleagues of mine at Sinai who use a longitudinal incision. And, and so the sort of subjective satisfaction of their scar was higher with a necklace incision. It's actually shorter. You can get better exposure. Um, no difference in the numbness. This is the groundbreaking there. research we need, Brad. What did you say? This is the groundbreaking research we need. It's incredibly <laughs> important research. But anyway, so if you haven't done it, I would Consider that. All right, so this is the technique I use, so we'll use a little uh, pin to hold it in place so that I don't have to deal with the plate. I did preserve that one skin nerve mat I listened to. You. I cut the other two, but that <laughs> one I saved. Um, and then I'll use sutures to help with those intercalary fragments, and you can put those above or below the plate. So this is what the patient got. And so now getting to Dr. Sethi's question, how do you guys treat this post-op? So Dan, what do you do? So I usually just do a sling for a week or two afterwards. As long as I'm confident of my fixation, uh, I let them start moving pretty okay. quick. Um, <clears throat> therapy, it really depends on the patient. You know, some young, younger patients, they start moving it almost too quick, and I don't need to do therapy. I'm trying to hold them back too quickly. Right. Back to sports, it depends on the sport. If it's a contact sport, like taco football, I'll hold them back a little bit longer. What's that, a little bit longer? Yeah, that's a good question. So I would probably look to doing back to non-contact sports around six weeks or so and I'm really looking back. So you mean like cross-country running? <clears throat> yeah I'll let them run okay. for sure like that. I worry about soccer even basketball which you know depends on who the refs are whether it's contact or not okay. and I'm looking to do contact sports by three months. Okay Dan how about you? I would I, I, my patients are not that compliant I try to keep them in a sling a little bit longer than two weeks because um, if I tell them four weeks they'll stay in it for two weeks but I usually yeah. do four weeks they can start some pendulums Early. I agree with what he said in that not everybody needs physical therapy. Um, I, I don't have a lot of patients whose shoulders get stiff, okay. uh, so take them out of the sling in about a month. I, I would hold them out of any sports probably for three months. I, sure. Again, I just don't trust the patients. Um, and contact sports probably <coughs> closer to four or five months. So David, return to sport, is that a clinical diagnosis, a radiographic diagnosis, and all the above diagnosis? How do you decide? All the above. You know, okay. It's usually somewhere between <coughs> eight and 12 weeks for me, it just depends what the x-rays look like, it depends on the patient, it depends on the, obviously the, the physical exam, uh, as well as the sport, just like these guys have, uh, have echoed. Right, Matt, anything different? Uh, you know, it, the clinical progress tends to outpace the, um, the radiographic progress, so right. they'll, they'll feel like they're ready to go a little sooner. I, you know, I don't treat a lot of contact athletes, I'm treating more like plumbers and longshoremen, so usually that's like two or three months to get back, but I would say like the, the cyclists who do this, and it seems to be a lot of cyclists, yeah. I'd let them get back on the bike in maybe two months, but yeah, I would say contact sports would be three months. So Dr. Sethi, you were keen about this, so with your two-plate magic treatment, how quickly you're letting a football player in high school get back to football? I think the fracture pattern sort of matters. So if it's a nice intercalary <coughs> fragment where you can get an intercal get a nice screw, I think eight weeks is when you can be back in collision sports. I think for a cyclist, you know, you can talk about getting on a bike at two, three weeks max. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there, is there a difference between like a trainer bike and a you let them go to the actual riding on a bike outside? Yeah, I'm not worried. Bicycles are not scary to me. Okay. So, Paul has. <laughs> All right, we'll Paul, go on to case Paul, two. Another Paul, biker. Paul, have you had any of your cyclists? Yeah. What? Yeah. All right. Oh, no, perfect. Yeah. Thank you, David. Well done, buddy.
Oh, and Ray's here too. All right, Matt, you're free. <laughs> Th thank God that we have a trauma guy on the panel, because otherwise we'd be a remiss. We'd be, you know. myself, to get down <laughs> All right, so case number two, another biker, 23-year-old gentleman. Uh, again, exam is nerve acid intact, uh, skin is intact, he's otherwise healthy. He also was wearing a helmet, which is good. So these are his plane films. So Matt, what do you see, buddy? So he's got a uh, distal third clavicle fracture. He's got uh, separation of the coracoclavicular ligaments, a disruption of those ligaments. Those ligaments are probably attached to the lateral fragment, uh, which has given him basically a, a type three or type five AC separation pattern to this okay. fracture. All right. Um, and so, you know, when you see this, what do you tell Ray the patients uh, about their their issues long term. So, what's the non-union rate you think with this fracture? I'm gonna I'm gonna guess in line with the literature. Although they're small series, my approximate non-union rate is 50%. Yeah. And then, okay. if if I made the likelihood of symptomatic non-union or malunion, I probably say again about 50%. Yeah. So that's just a gestalt. About a quarter of these will come back and have problems if you don't treat them operatively. Right. So there's a nice series by Robinson that looked at lateral clavicle fractures like 2,000 something, two maybe JBJS, and, and that's exactly what they said. It was about a third or higher non-union rate, and of those, a third to a half had symptoms. Again, your sedentary patient may not care so much. Your active patient is likely going to not be so happy. All right, so Dan, how you, if you're going to treat this operatively, how are you going to treat it? What's your hardware du jour? Yeah, so uh, if I can do a distal third locking plate, I, I would. So I, can you in this? I Probably not. You Why know, not? So, I mean, I don't think we'll be able to make enough screw fixation on that distal fragment. Okay. So I would have a hook plate of it. I'd have both there, and I would put it on there and kind of see how I felt about it. And then if I didn't feel like I was getting adequate fixation, that distal fragment, which I don't think I would, because it also looks like there's some inferior comminution there, that distal fragment, I yeah. would do a hook plate. All right. Dan, anything different? Uh, I would... Uh, I would do a arthroscopic coracoclavicular ligament fixation with like a dog bone. Okay. So probably not use a plate. Okay. Um, I have several of these. They tend to heal well, um, yep. and uh, I think it's minimally invasive. Make a small incision over the superior aspect of the clavicle. Uh, make sure you can get it reduced. Uh, and if I can, which I would expect this if this is acute, be able to get it get it reduced. You might have to get a little bit of soft tissue out of the fracture site. But if you can get it reduced, then uh, stick a scope in the shoulder and. Just do a dog bone. Okay. Do you, do you drill through the coracoid or do you loop it? Drill through the coracoid. Matt? So I, I do something similar. I, I usually do these arthroscopically. Um, I usually go around the coracoid with sutures, um, and then I make a small incision over the distal, distal clavicle uh, so I can tie my sutures around the clavicle and reduce uh, the medial side to that lateral fragment. Okay. If I have enough bone, sometimes I use small, uh, small frag or, or mini frag screws to hold them together. Okay. I've fixed these things with plates. If the bone on the lateral side is bigger, I've used the hook plate in occasion, but I don't like that because they always have to come out. Yep. Uh, but for this one, I think arthroscopic assisted possible ORF with small screws laterally or fragment excision I don't think is, is an unreasonable thing in some cases. This one, I wouldn't excise this one. I think I could probably get some screws from the top to the bottom. So why would you excise? So this one I wouldn't excise, but, no, but I, there are If you had a fracture that's acute, why would you excise? Well, I think that if it's a small fragment and say the CC ligaments are split, especially if it's more of an oblique pattern between the ligaments, I don't think the lateral fragment buys you anything if you're reconstructing the okay. CC ligaments. But, so I would, I'm gonna be contrarian. I mean, I personally feel like bone to bone healing, Better. way more reliable than ligament sure. graft to bone healing. Sure, sometimes I think the common to fragments laterally in those situations, gotcha. I don't think they're bringing much to the table. Yeah. All right, Ray, I know you're putting a plate in this, so what plate are you using? Because yeah. you're a trauma guy, you have to use a plate. Well, you're right. First, I wouldn't know what an arthroscope looks like anymore. <laughs> no, no, so seriously, I, I, I tend to agree with you, uh, Brad, in the terms of bone-to-bone -bone healing. Yeah. It's kind of impressive. I mean, I've, I've only had a handful of these, maybe six, ten, I don't know. And a hook plate will mash it down, and usually I'll get bone-to-bone -bone healing. Yeah, you have to come back. And you have to take the plate out. Yeah. And I worry about a contact athlete refracturing through screw holes once you've yeah. taken a plate out. But, I mean, this is a biker. But nonetheless, yeah, I'm probably putting a hook plate in there. And the union rates are pretty good that way. All right. Who in the audience is using a hook plate for this fracture? Okay. Who in the audience is using an arthroscopic CC du jour, dog bone, sutures, whatever? All right. Who in the audience is using a lateral locking clavicle plate for this fracture? Okay, and who in the audience is using just sutures? You guys are smart, the suture hey, people. Brad, any reason, yeah. anybody not going around the, uh, the coracoids and just looping sutures? 
that fragment still has the CC ligament to it, so you're going to pass underneath the bone with the head and suture. The bottom line of the slide is you're very poignant. So does this fracture obligate coracoclavicular fixation down the line? I, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, in my hands, if I put a hook plate on that, I think those fracture fragments line up pretty well. Okay. And you're getting bone-to-bone -bone healing, and at least you're having the lateral CC ligaments approximated. Yeah. Now, the, the medium or medial CC ligaments may not be as well approximated, but I'm not sure in the acute setting if this is a week or two out. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking you're probably going to get a pretty equivalent result. Now, long, like if this was subacute, three months, four months, yeah. I might be inclined to take a semi-T or some sort of graft and wrap okay. it around. And Matt, mash it under the coracoid. You say you're going around the coracoid. Yeah, the CC, uh, for me, the CC fixation is the reduction tool. So yeah. uh, that's why I think that's important. I don't think we're going to get stronger CC ligaments. Obviously, the ligaments are attached to the lateral <laughs> fragment here. But there does look to be a comminuted uh, piece on that lateral side, on the underside. And if you don't augment that, I think you're bound to fail. The hook plate's probably not going to fail, but then you're, you're buying a second surgery. And sometimes with the hook plate, you almost have to sell that second surgery to patients. They do fine for six or eight weeks, and you tell them, hey, Mr. Smith, we got to take this thing out. The one the of the most miserable patients I ever had to treat was a patient who had a minimally displaced type 2 clavicle fracture like this that was treated with a hook plate and came back at three months wickedly stiff. You know, it's fractured, probably didn't need surgery in the first place. He healed, and then I had to take his hook plate out and do a capsule release and everything. So they're very powerful tools, but, um, you know, I don't like the idea of a second surgery. So these are the historic options, lots of things. For me personally, if I'm using a locking plate, the clavicle fracture has to be at the level of the medial side of the coracoid base. Otherwise, the distal fragment usually has a T type. It's like a, it's got a horizontal split, and you've got, like, crappy little locking screws and crappy little bone, and for me it just doesn't work. So that's my guide for when I use a lateral locking plate. So I did do this with a suture construct, so all sutures, so I use coracoclavicular sutures and I use horizontal interfrag sutures. So that's a study by Javier Duraldi. So I marked the AC joint so I know where it is, so I know how lateral I need to go, so it's a small saber incision in skin lines. These are the interfrags, so horizontal sutures going figure of eight through the medial and lateral fragment. And then I'll use a cerclage system to reduce the clavicle around the coracoid. So the tensioner actually does this for you. Dr. Cagle, my partner, he helped uh, innovate this with, with how we use this for these type of injuries with me. He showed me how to do this. And so it's a really simple tool that sort of does the work for you. And then you can just tie everything down. And so that's what the construct is. Uh, and, and I do feel like bone, bone healing is more reliable than you know, soft tissue to bone healing. All right, so you fixed it. Down the line, Dan, when are you letting them get back to activity? Do these heal the same rate as mid-shaft or slower or faster? What do you think? Uh, much slower. So uh, I'll do a sling for at least six weeks, and sometimes, depending how much I like the patient, I'll make them do a gunslinger brace. Okay. Um, plate versus does rehab different? I mean, I generally do a hook plate. I mean, return to activity, so I'll let them start moving the shoulder, and I'll rehab them because I am worried about them getting stiff right around six weeks. Okay. And then I look at considering starting to take the plate out after three months, but a little bit depends on how they're feeling and what the x-rays look like. All right, so if you have them in a hook plate, do you start rehab with the hook plate in? I start them doing some gentle rehab. I want them to get a movement. I don't want them to get that situation where they get stiff, and I yeah. think that is important. Okay. Generally, I've seen people with hook plates actually can have pretty good motion and function. They have a little bit of pain, but I mean, if your AC joint's not moving, you still can move your shoulder pretty good. All right. Matt, you were going to do an art, or Dan, one of you two guys was going to do an arthroscopic technique. Any difference in speed of return to activity for you guys with that technique? Uh, well, I do think that as opposed to like a mid shaft clavicle fracture for these, it's a little bit more reliant on the, how the x rays look and how the patient's doing. So I think it is a little bit slower. I do worry more about these healing, uh, not as well as a mid shaft clavicle fracture. So I will slow them down. Uh, more of a clinical, yeah, I don't, wouldn't say I have a set protocol for this, but more of a clinical, if they're feeling well, if their fracture's healing on x-ray, then I'm a little bit, then I'll start moving them. Okay. Yeah, I treat them the same way as mid shaft clavicle fracture. Four weeks in the sling for me, three months for contact sports. Um, and again, the nice thing about having sutures is that you can get a better look at the healing than you can with the plate. So I think right. that's one thing. There's often less stripping uh, than when you're putting a, a mid shaft uh, clavicle plate on. Yeah. Um, I worry about soft tissue healing and muscular healing uh, for the contact athletes. And that's why I delay my return to play for three months because I want their pec contour and their deltoid and their trapezius to look the same on the other side and function as well. And I think if you go back too quickly because of strong fixation with yeah. the plates, you can compromise that a bit. Right. Ray, how long do you leave the hook plate in? At least three months. Okay, and it's x-ray, just automatic three months, or how do you decide when to take it out? Yeah, I mean, you'll see radiographic healing generally. You can, okay. you can appreciate that, and generally, again, three months. The rehab protocol is similar to my, my colleague to my right. 
um, in terms of range of motion. And you know, I think anybody can get adhesive capsulitis in a stiff shoulder. No, that's true. And, I, and, I, and I've certainly seen stiff shoulders either way. Everybody with a hook plate gets some impingement. There's no yeah. question. And they all feel markedly better once it comes out. Yeah. Right. So. You ever had a patient disappear and come back like a year later with a hook plate through their acromion? Fortunately, none of mine, but I have inherited some others. Yeah. And, I've, and I've seen people a year out where it fortunately hasn't eroded all the way through the acromion, but yeah, that's, that's something you've got to tell them up front. This thing's coming out. There's no role to leave it in. Yeah, that's one you have to make sure you keep on. All right, so let's go to the next case. 26-year-old, again, New York City, works in finance, plays rugby for New York Sports Club, so fairly high-level recreational mm -hmm. rugby. Right hand dominant, healthy, fell off its bike again. These are all biking injuries for the most part, nerve vascular intact. So, all right, we'll start with Matt. Matt, you know, so you see this, he's got a fairly significant AC separation. Do you do anything on examination other than say, ah, oh, you got a bump? Well, I, a few things. Yeah, I, I, I want to know their nerve vascular status with these things. I think sometimes you can stretch out the lateral plexus. I want to make sure that their musculocutaneous nerve is working so I get a good exam on their, on their bicep. I want to make sure their axillary nerve is doing fine. I also want to feel how easy it is to reduce. Um, okay. you know, if I can push on the elbow and reduce it easily, uh, I think that's uh, you know, a, a key indicator of how well they may do with this. I also so wait, want to know if there's spell an that, Spell that out. So, so if it reduces, that's a good thing or a bad thing to treat no, non I think if it, is this an audience question? So if it, if it reduces on your exam, you can, you can push on it, it falls back into place. Is that a, a, an injury that you're going to treat non-operatively or operatively? Which yes, way does that push you? They're very easily reducible, and it's very floppy. Those are somebody I think is going to do poorly with non-operative treatment. Okay, so if it reduces easily, you, that is a push towards surgery push for you. Push towards surgery, Okay. Yeah. But I, I'll tell you, I hate, to, especially type 3 AC injuries, because we just don't know who's going to do well with these and who's not going to do well in general. Okay. So it's one of the injuries I hate. Active people, I tend to be more surgically oriented, yeah. uh, more inactive patients, uh, I tend to wait. Okay. Dan, in the middle, any difference, any, any physical exam pearls that you use to help guide your treatment? No, I, I don't typically try to reduce these acute injuries in the office. The patients usually don't let me. Um, if I push on their distal clavicle, they, they usually say it hurts. Um, and I don't actually know. That's a good, though you had a good question. What difference does it make if it's reducible or not? Um, I would think if it's easily reducible, uh, maybe you stick them in a sling. But I think either way, in three months, it's going to look like that. Right. Um, if, we, if we treat it conservatively, it's, or worse, maybe it gets worse. Anybody in the audience have any? Pearl that helps them differentiate the bad actor type three versus the good actor type three that's going to manage non operatively. Paul said that you're doing a lot of stuff over there. Cross arm reduction. Okay. It, it, on, on the, sort of the bad threes, most threes are not. So you do this and it hurts more or causes crepitus, that's a surgical indication? No, you, you see the tip of the clavicle sort of translate out posteriorly. Ah, there you go, buddy. All right. So to me, that also helps me try to differentiate the ones that have posterior translation, because I do think posterior translation is a worse indicator than pure vertical issues, and so I will use that same maneuver that Paul said. Other thing is I'll have them hold ex resisted external rotation, and what you'll see is the clavicle also shifts back a little bit and can cause some pain and crepitus. So those are the two things I do that helps me differentiate the type 3 that's a bad versus new. What's this type, guys? Dan, what do you call this? Is this a type 3, type 5, type 7? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think this is probably a type five. It looks like we're in the 100% um, CC distance. Question in the back. A uh, question, but pearls for examination. You guys turn the patient around and look at their scapula. Lovely. Because there's tremendous amount of dyskinesis that occurs in this. There is now a committee, the Sackos Committee, the longest name in the world, the Sackos Committee to distinguish between the type two types of threes, the three, the sort of three A and the three B. Yeah. To see if it's posteriorly translated. Gotcha. Dr. Murthy. Hey, um, does anyone get any kind of other imaging of, other than the x ray under this uh, one AP urgent care x ray that Brad uses from New York? <laughs> <laughs> 
I get an axillary review. Axillary. As well. Oh, thank yeah. God. Gravity is a skill, buddy. Thank God. <laughs> how about MRI? There's been some uh, papers Paul's published on how to get as many MRIs from his own MRI center on AC joints. <laughs> Look at it, slap tears. Anyone get any other imaging? Oh, I will occasionally get an MRI. I don't own the MRI center, unfortunately. Thank God. But, All right. but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he'll take care of that. All right, cool. Thanks. All right. So, what are our choices here? All right, uh, Matt, how, how are you going to counsel a patient? What are you going to tell them? How are you going to guide their treatment? Sure. For, so for those very unstable ones, especially with the posterior translation um, and in an active individual, they're going to be pushed more towards an operative uh, treatment. Yep. Uh, for me, I usually do a reconstruction arthroscopically with a semi-T uh, graft, a couple fiber tapes, one of them in a niece knot configuration. I go around the coracoid, I go around the clavicle, I tie it down. Okay. I tend to do very well. <clears throat> Ray, do you, do you see these? We see them all the time, and I have a feeling that we neglect a few, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. these come in with patients that are, you know, open book pelvis and yeah, yeah. More problems. important stuff. But it's more bigger fish to fry often, right? Not to say they don't do well, and I share my, the opinions of my colleagues in regards to you got to know who's going to do poorly. And this single view doesn't tell you, right? You can't tell if that's out through the trapezius posteriorly. Right. Right. And in a couple weeks, I bet you could once the swelling has come down. Certainly with additional imaging, CT or MRI would also tell you if you soft tissue winded the CT. And if I see something out through the trapezius, I would agree, that's not gonna do well. And I would, I, for me, obviously, I'd do an open technique and use semitendinosis. But. So Brad, I, I Brad can, I, can we check to see if Butch can chime in? Butch, can you hear me, buddy? Can you, you got any comments? Yeah, brother, good morning. Good morning, good morning everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah it's perfect. We've got this a type uh, three slash five Hey, Brad, why don't you tell them what we got? So, so, this is, so as my mentor would say, a type 3 and a type 5, the way you differentiate is type 5 has good insurance. <laughs> type 3 doesn't. So we, we, we got a type 5 AC separation in a 26-year-old rugby player who works in finance <laughs> in the city. So how do you manage that, Butch? Yeah, so there was a very savvy Indian guy I heard just a little while ago talk about the, the posterior translation test, which is really the key for us. You know, if there's any posterior translation, as Gus Mazaka has talked about with these, types of fractures, the key in fixing it is not just controlling the pivot of the scapula, it's, it's the posterior rotation of the clavicle that happens. And that's why radiographically these may look, you know, not so great postoperatively if you do fix it, but the patients do well. So if they have posterior translation, for me, this is a, an open fix for the semitendinosis tendon. All right. So Butch, are you going around the clavicle or through the clavicle with your semitendinosis? Man, I go around, through, up, down, side, <laughs> backwards. No, but uh, in, in truth, actually, uh, uh, my partner, Eddie Lowe, has, has been studying this, and we've been trying to figure out how to control the rotation. Because traditionally, what we've done is uh, not only go around the coracoid and through the clavicle, but go over to the acromion as well. So a coracoclavicular and a chromoclavicular. Eddie has actually been uh, working on what he calls the lasso of truth, which is to really reinforce the posterior rotation of the clavicle by taking the graft, uh, second part of it, and weaving it almost in, uh, he calls it Wonder Woman's lasso, I don't know, you can ask him about that, uh, around the clavicle to the acromion. It's kind of similar to what Jim Taboni and Ty Lee talked about by putting a graft intramedullary just to try to control the posterior rotation. Okay. So I did a traditional Mazaka approach, so two tunnels, semitendinosis graft around the coracoid, up vertically through the two tunnels, little peaks screws to hold the graft in place so there wasn't a big knot stack above the clavicle. Um, and so these are my post-operative x-rays. You know, did I over-reduce this? Is it the way it's supposed to be? How do you guys know? Do you get x-rays of the other side? So Matt, are you always imaging the other side? Because there's a lot of difference in the way the AC joint is shaped amongst people, at least in my, in my experience. Yeah, I think the only way to be sure is to get imaging of the other side. That says, I never, I never do that. Um, <laughs> I think you, I probably have a tendency to overreduce them. To me, this looks good. I think you have a, a nice, uh, you know, the top of the coracoid, the top of the acromion, I say, is, is level with the top of the clavicle. I think it looks nice. Uh, the Y view, uh, everything looks lined up very well. So for me, this is a good job. I think, it, I think it looks great. All right. When do you guys start rehab, Dan? So I, for these, I do, I do the same thing as Mazaka. I do make sure, like we were just talking about, uh, connect it to the acromion. I overreduce these as well because I feel like they always loosen some. Okay. I fit them for a gunslinger brace ahead of time. Um, gunslinger brace? I'm Jesus. Making, yeah. Your uh, patients must hate you. They do. It's true. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> hey, Paul. Uh, so I put him in a gunslinger for six weeks, and part of it is like what Dan over here was saying, that if I tell him to do that and then uh, they loosen up because they weren't wearing it, I'm like, well, you should have been wearing your brace. I don't have to tell you about it. All right. Um, and then I start rehab at six weeks. Dan, what do you tell patients is going to happen to this after they're treated? Like, so is it going to stay like this? Is it going to ride back up? Is it going to... You know, what's the long-term likelihood? Long-term, it's likely to stretch somewhat. Uh, okay. It's not going to. I tell them, you know, it's ho it's certainly should not go back to where it was. Um, but I don't think. I mean, honestly, unless you're treating a physician who's, you know, looking at these X-rays, uh, I don't think they're going to know a dif notice the difference. They, they're going to have a scar. There's probably going to be a, a bump forever. Um, but you know, that some somewhat less is more to sometimes telling these patients that. Yeah. Very. Uh, Cosmetically concerned New Yorkers, I've learned the hard way that you have to tell them, at least I do, that it's likely I'm taking a type 3 or 5 to a type 2 eventually, that they're going to have a little bit of prominence when all is said and done. Dr. Lutton. I think the key with that is just stop getting x-rays at about three months. Ah. It stretches out <laughs> all right, so patient. hold that thought because so, this is the x-ray at four months. Very so. good. So, 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 I know. So just real quick question for the, the panelists. Is everyone using graft with an acute rupture? No. Well, I mean, that's what so how do you here. know when, to, when, what's your cutoff for acute? Uh, Dan, you, you were quick to say no. Four weeks. Four weeks. So within four weeks, you don't use a graft. After four weeks, you do? Typically, yes. Okay. Matt? I do it every time. I do it every time because I feel like- It uh, works all I the time, every time. the whole thing and the kitchen sink included. All right. I do the same thing. I always do a graft. Ray? Uh, my answer stays the same. No, I wouldn't do a graft within four weeks, like the first distal clavicle fracture. Are you treating this with just a big old screw? This? Yeah. No. Okay. No, I, this, this one, this one's good. No, but I mean, you know, I just, if there's no metal in there, there's a problem. I mean, <laughs> all right, so I show these x-rays because to me, those tunnels are widening. And I used an allograft in this case for the panel. Is this something that we expect to see with graft use, either allograft or autograft, or does it matter if the graft is autograft versus allograft? Dan, what do you think? I mean, I always do allograft. I wouldn't worry too much about the tunnels winding. I think it's expected. Okay, Dan? I would say the same. Matt? I use allograft. I think the tunnel widening is expected, but the reason I don't do this is because I don't want to look at it, so I wrap it around the cloud so I avoid that problem. All right. Anybody in the audience thinks there's a difference between autograft and allograft in terms of tunnel lysis or lucency or widening? Interesting, okay. Hey, Brad, this is Butch. If yeah. I can just weigh in for a sec. You know, we reported the Sports Medicine Society a few years ago that there actually was a radiographic difference, a statistical difference between use of autograft and allograft. And the reason we stopped using autograft is people cannot understand why we're going to touch their legs when we're fixing their shoulders. Right. And I was hearing the, the whole idea about, uh, you know, the bumps and the scars. And I think it's great not to take x-rays, but basically we just tell our patients, listen, you might heal in such a way that the graft is going to cause, cause a bump and then it takes away all of that fear. Gotcha. So I do think there might be a little difference. I also use allograft almost exclusively for the reasons Butch said. So I know I should stop taking x-rays, but he comes back after playing golf and grounding his club at six months. All right. So what now? Dan, number one. Yeah. Um, I mean, he fractured there through that medial tunnel. Yep. Uh, I mean, he's... He didn't displace as far as his ligaments, so it looks like it's scarred down and healed somewhat. Uh, I mean, I guess. He came in because it hurt, or he just he was coming for a regular follow-up? No, he came in, he felt a pop when he hit the, when he grounded the club and had new swelling and some ecchymosis and came in. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is whether I think this would heal non-op. I mean, it's not displaced enough, if, like as far as an isolated clavicle shaft fracture, but with graft in there, is it just not gonna heal? Uh, so I would probably be pretty concerned about that. and. Um, I mean, honestly, I think you could probably do either way. You could treat him non-op and see if he's starting to feel better, and if he's not, then you take him back and do an RAF, which is the same, and he's going to be at the same place where he's at now. Ray, any advanced imaging you're going to get for this? I might get a CT, but I don't, I mean, you know what the diagnosis is. Right. You, you might want to know how big of a hole you're dealing with. I'd probably stop where I, I'd probably stop while you're ahead, give this a chance to heal. Yeah. You can still range his shoulder. That's I think wrong. it's still united. But, um... <laughs> What'd you say, Adam? Sorry. Uh, the pole. I mean the pole. Oh, that's, that's mean, guys. That's just mean. <laughs> if you can't see the poll question, it's who thinks Dr. Gallitz would have done a better job fixing this? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sethi. Uh, it's, it's really not nice, but all right. So I did treat this non-operatively, and he went on to heal this. And, and, but this is the last case that I did a two-tunnel 
graph technique, especially in a rugby player, which everybody glossed over when I presented that. He's a contact athlete. These are the ones that I would avoid doing tunnels. Now, I will tell you, Matt. But he, he broke it playing golf, right? I know, but the problem is if you talk to the people who take care of high-level athletes, football you know, teams and stuff like that, they don't drill holes through the clavicle anymore. Yeah. And they try not to drill holes through the coracoid because of the risk of fracture. And so I think what I've noticed, though, is even with my wraparound technique, you'll see lucency on the superior surface of the clavicle from the graft. So I think there's a shear factor of these, which is why the point that was made about the AC joint is so important. If you talk to Gus Mazaka, who's looked at this more than anybody in the world, he feels that AC fixation, in addition to your CC fixation, is critical for these injuries to try to give rotational stability to the clavicle. Are you cutting me off? I'm cutting you off. What? I have two more cases. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you.